Uh, good afternoon. I'm Robert Shapiro, and I teach constitutional law here at Emory Law School. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to this special event in the life of the law school. On this commencement weekend, I'd like to extend especially warm greetings to the class of 2011 and to your family and friends. My colleagues on the faculty and I congratulate you for all that you have achieved over the past three years. And I'm very glad that we could share this occasion as part of the festive weekend marking your graduation. Uh, first, just three preliminary notes. Uh, following the secretary's remarks, uh, she's kindly agreed to take questions. Uh, so when it's time for that, I'd ask you to line up behind the microphones on either side of the auditorium. Uh, second, at this time, please make sure that your phones and electronic devices are silenced. Uh, I'll note that cybersecurity is part of the core mission of the Department of Homeland Security, so they will know who you are. Um, third, uh, and most important, an event like this takes a tremendous amount of work uh, by the secretary and her great team, uh, and also by the many wonderful people at Emory Law School. Uh, they've attended to every detail of this occasion. There are too many of them uh, to thank individually, uh, but I'd like to extend my thanks to all of you for all that you have done. Now, at Emory Law School, we pride ourselves on preparing lawyers who will use their skills to advance the public interest. And there is no greater example of a lawyer who has used her legal training to advance the public service than our honored guest, the Secretary of Homeland Security. Throughout her life, Secretary Napolitano has been a trailblazer. She graduated from Santa Clara University as that university's first female valedictorian. She received her law degree from the University of Virginia and clerked for Judge Mary Schroeder of the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Secretary Napolitano then used her legal education to pursue a very distinguished career in public service. She was the United States Attorney for the District of Arizona. She served as the first female Attorney General of Arizona, and she was twice elected Governor of Arizona. In that role, she was recognized as a national leader on homeland security, border security, and immigration. Secretary Napolitano was the first woman to chair the National Governors Association and was named one of the top five governors in the nation by Time Magazine. President Obama nominated her and she was confirmed by the Senate in January 2009 as the Secretary of Homeland Security. Now, Secretary Napolitano was the third person to hold the office of Secretary of Homeland Security and it is worth noting that like her, her two predecessors were also lawyers. When the nation has looked for leaders to keep us safe and free, uh, they have looked to the legal profession. The department keeps the United States secure from threats, both human and natural. Its mission extends from compounds in Pakistan to stormed ravage areas in Alabama, from protecting the borders of Arizona to welcoming new citizens at New York's Ellis Island. While vigilantly protecting the physical security of the United States, Secretary Napolitano has emphasized that rights and security work in tandem, that the fundamental rights and freedoms that we all enjoy are a vital part of the homeland that she works tirelessly to help secure. We at the law school could not be more pleased that on Monday, Secretary Napolitano will be receiving an honorary Doctor of Law degrees from Emory University, and she'll be the keynote speaker commencement. We are proud that in this way, Secretary Napolitano will be joining the ranks of Emory lawyers. For those of you graduating on Monday, she will be your classmate. Uh, there could not be a finer example of a lawyer who is a leader in public service. Uh, she is indeed an inspiration to us all. So I'd ask you to please join me in welcoming your classmate, the Secretary of Homeland Security, the Honorable Janet Napolitano. Well, thank you. <laughs> I'm glad to be part of the Emory class of 2011 and look forward to receiving uh, my uh, dunning from the Alumni Association, so and paying my fair share. Uh, thank you, Professor Shapiro. Thanks to the law school for uh, asking me to, to speak. Um, I look forward to Monday's events and congratulate all of you who are uh, graduating on uh, Monday. Uh, I say thank you to the students who are here today who are not graduating but who came to hear a speaker on a Saturday afternoon. I think that's, that portends well for your futures. And uh, uh, thanks to the parents who are here as well, especially the mothers. Tomorrow is Mother's Day after all. Um, 
I want to talk about uh, public service and a career in public service, but before I do that, um, I want to pause and say a few words about the topic that is on everyone's mind this week, and that is uh, the uh, capture and death of Osama bin Laden last Sunday. Um, uh, that, of course, was an extraordinary success uh, for the United States, but really for, for the world. And I think the intel community, our armed forces, the counterterrorism community, all who played in such a persistent, consistent, and uh, long-time role in bringing this matter to justice, as the President said, uh, are to be commended. But uh, that is not the end of our nation's counterterrorism efforts. Uh, we have to remain vigilant. Uh, the threat to the United States uh, exists. It's ever-evolving. It can come from a variety of sources, both international and, uh, to a greater and greater degree, homegrown. Uh, individuals who, for whatever reason, reasons we don't completely understand yet, uh, become converted to uh, uh, to become violent extremists. Uh, they become jihadists, Islamists, whatever uh, word you wish to use, um, and then decide to act out on their own. Um, so uh, that requires that uh, we involve more than just one federal department in the security of the country. No one federal department can do it, even one as big and diverse as the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, it requires all of the federal assets uh, that we have. It requires uh, greater connectivity with state and local law enforcement, uh, which we have been developing over the past several years. Um, it requires uh, the private sector, particularly the parts of the private sector that control critical infrastructure recognize that 85 percent or so of the critical infrastructure of the United States is actually in private, not government hands. Uh, and it requires greater involvement by the citizenry. Uh, as um, uh, you know, I like to remind people, uh, everybody should be uh, alert, not alarm, but alert. Um, and uh, the mantra, see something, say something, ought to be something that we all remember and, and share. It's easy to remember, but the whole idea is to uh, uh, discuss security as a shared responsibility for the public at large, a core competency of our critical infrastructure, and an ongoing effort by state, local, and federal counterterrorism and law enforcement officials. And that's where it is. And so even as we uh, unpack uh, the in intel uh, that was gathered, uh, this past weekend from uh, bin Laden's uh, compound. Uh, we need to understand that uh, he was one part of a much larger, more complex threat environment. Um, saying that, uh, and that's somewhat a grim way, I suspect, to begin my talk, but it kind of segues into uh, why a legal education uh, is such uh, a wonderful education to have uh, to put into the service uh, of the country. Um, when I graduated from law school, there was a, uh, there was a real pattern. You graduated from law school, uh, and then um, if you were fortunate enough to have a clerkship, you clerked. Uh, that's what actually took me to Arizona. I had never lived in Arizona. I grew up in New Mexico, but New Mexico is a very different state than Arizona. I know for you Easterners, they all look like these big square states out in the Southwest, but um, they're really quite different. Um, and um, uh, much to my surprise, I ended up liking Arizona and staying there and building my career there in a very uh, standard fashion. I joined a large law firm. Uh, I was a litigator. I was a commercial litigator. I handled basically appeals work for our firm. We had worked throughout the Southwest. I had the opportunity to handle a, a large variety of cases in a variety of courts around the country, uh, and I got excellent training there. But when uh, the call came to ask if I was interested in becoming the U.S. attorney uh, for the District of Arizona, Arizona's all one federal district, uh, uh, my, of course my first question was really, well, what's a U.S. attorney? Um, uh, I'd been in, in, the, in the private sector, uh, but I, I explored it, looked at it for a few days, and called back and said I definitely would be interested, and became the chief federal prosecutor 
for uh, one of the largest uh, U.S. attorney's offices in the country, uh, handling everything from violent crime on Indian reservations, uh, because those all come into federal court, uh, to uh, managing a large section of the Oklahoma City bombing investigation, uh, because McVeigh planned that bombing while he was in Arizona, to doing a fair amount of white collar work and border related work. Uh, that was when I first became intimately familiar with the southwest border, with the drug cartels and the drug trafficking patterns along that border, with illegal immigration. I supervised well over 6,000 immigration felony cases myself, um, and uh, all of the issues involved with being a border state. Uh, uh, but then when the time came, and, and uh, uh, I'd been U.S. Attorney for a little over four years, and uh, I was about to turn 40, so I was 39, uh, and the attorney generalship of our state uh, was opening up, uh, and I'd always had in the back of my mind whether I should run for public office, uh, which uh, is a type of public service. And I want to pause a moment there because I think too often uh, running for public office gets a bad name. There is no better way to affect systemic change than occupying public office. Uh, and being in, in politics is tough, there's no doubt about it, but it's intensely rewarding in that sense. Ran for attorney general, everybody said, um, uh, well, the, I thought, gee, I've been the U.S. attorney for four years, I've had all these big cases, everybody will know me, this will be great. I did a poll to test my name recognition, and it was like, you know, like, 4%, <laughs> and, and I think half of them were people I'd convicted. <laughs> <laughs> and they were felons, they couldn't vote anyway, so anyway. Um, so you know, there's a little humility that gets built into the process, uh, but we built a campaign from scratch, and uh, I ran as a Democrat in Arizona, uh, and also an interesting experience, um, and uh, won. Uh, that race served one term and handled a variety of cases. That's a different job than being U.S. Attorney because you, you see the whole civil side of the government as well as uh, in that uh, office we did all of the death penalty work in the state of Arizona and um, for a variety of reasons we had about a dozen executions while I was uh, serving as AG. Uh, cases that took me to the U.S. Supreme Court where I argued and also to the International Criminal Court of Justice at The Hague where I also argued. Um, uh, and then. Uh, uh, after a term of that, the governorship was open, open seat. There's a little pattern here you might see. And ran for office there uh, and was privileged to serve as uh, the governor uh, at a time of unparalleled growth uh, in our state's economy, in our state's population, but also in terms of illegal immigration into our state. Um, because what happened was the federal government had effectively closed the borders at San Diego had effectively closed the border at El Paso, uh, had effectively closed the border at Laredo, um, and all that illegal immigrant traffic funneled right up through Arizona. Uh, and uh, uh, we did a number of things at the state level to deal with that. Uh, I dealt extensively with my predecessor, Mike Chertoff, uh, on this issue. Uh, and then, of course, when President Obama was elected, he asked me to serve in my current role, in part because of that experience and in part because of some of the other things that I had been dealing with over the years. Uh, so w one of the points I would leave you with um, is, is that none of the things I have mentioned I envisioned when I was uh, sitting uh, two days before my law school graduation. I did not envision I would end up practicing in a state in which I had never lived. Uh, I did not envision that I would be the secretary of a cabinet department that did not even exist at the time. Uh, and the point is that the legal profession and a legal education provides one with abilities. Uh, the ability to process lots of information uh, while honing in on what is most important. What is the issue presented? What are the most key pieces of data or intelligence uh, that you need to have. Um, the ability to read and digest lots of information. 
Um, there, there's, a, there's a reason uh, they, they have that phrase, thinking like a lawyer. Well, part of thinking like a lawyer is processing lots of information uh, like a lawyer. And there's no education uh, anywhere that provides that skill as law does. Um, the ability to think across uh, uh, stovepipes and to uh, take a st step back and see, well, what is the problem that needs to be solved? Uh, and then to devise ways with which to solve it. That is what one does as an attorney in practice. You, you have a client, your client has a problem, uh, your client uh, inevitably wants to solve it one way. Uh, your job is to say, well, wait a minute, is that the best way? <laughs> is that a legal way? Uh, no, you cannot kill your neighbor for the barking dog. Uh, um, other things of that sort. Um, uh, but to develop new and, and creative solutions uh, to problems. And that's uh, part of what one does in a job such as mine as well. Uh, and the ability to multitask, to juggle multiple things at the same time. Uh, to, uh, in the first year, learn about contracts and then torts and then civil procedure and all these myriad subjects. Um, the ability in practice to juggle several cases simultaneously. Uh, the ability in a public service office uh, to handle multiple levels of activity um, so that, for example, in the last 10 days, uh, we've been dealing with Osama bin Laden and the outfall from that. We've been dealing with record tornadoes uh, throughout the southeast, the devastation caused, the deaths caused, uh, as well as flooding along the entire Mississippi and decisions about whether uh, levees need to be blown up uh, so that small areas uh, have to be sacrificed for the benefit of larger areas to uh, congressional hearings about the effectiveness of our southwest border response. Um, and so the ability to juggle all those things uh, simultaneously and where does one first really begin to master that? You really first begin to master it um, as a law student at a school like Emory. Uh, and so uh, I encourage those of you who are still thinking about what are you going to do uh, and how are you going to go about it uh, to consider a career in public service. Uh, I have found it to be immensely enriching and rewarding, not in the financial sense, but as I like to say, psychic dollars. Um, um, uh, and, uh, but in, uh, in ways that, uh, as I like to say, I don't want to be uh, you know, 90 years old and sitting in my rocking chair, rocking back and forth and thinking woulda, coulda, shoulda, uh, I will want to sit there thinking about the things I was able to help accomplish for the greater good. Uh, and that's what public service is all about. Thank you very much. Let's see if anybody has questions about any topic whatsoever. Someone will go first. Well, secret uh, well, Secretary, I'm Bill Busby on the faculty here. And having, uh, having led a state and a large bureaucracy there, then heading the new department, which is a merger of an even vaster bureaucracy, I'm just wondering about if you could reflect a little bit on what it means to be a leader in those settings and how you've dealt with perhaps different organizations that have had to come together and cooperate? Well, um, uh, yeah, when I took over, um, you know, the, when you are a governor, you, you have to, when you come in, uh, you have to master a, a, a myriad of things. My state had a population of around 6.7 million uh, when I left. Uh, it was the, uh, second or third fastest growing state in the country, so we had huge growth issues to deal with. Um, we had the immigration issue, as I mentioned before, to deal with. Uh, and we had a huge kind of catch-up issue to deal with because we had not been funding education uh, really at all uh, in any significant way. Uh, and we needed to be much more aggressive, not only in K-12, but particularly higher education, community colleges and universities, because when you look at what, if you look at things that really match up to prosperity in the long term, uh, 
one of the key, if not the key factor, is the number of people in the state who have a bachelor's degree from a university. It's just a key driver of economic prosperity and growth. Um, and our percentage was too low, and so we were really focused on that, just as President Obama is focused on it nationally today. Um, when I moved over to Homeland Security, uh, uh, there, it was a much different set of issues. Uh, first of all, as you mentioned, 22 agencies thrown under one roof, and well, not even under one roof. I mean, we are spread all over the D.C. We do not have a headquarters building. Um, uh, until recently, uh, just before I came in as secretary, there was barely even a common email or phone system, uh, not to mention budget, acquisition, personnel, procurement. Uh, all the things that are kind of nuts and bolts, non-sexy, but go into efficient and effective government. So one of the things you do in, in, at the top position is you, you try to set the tone, establish the priorities, and establish um, what you are counting on the theory that what you count counts. And the bureaucracy will move to that end. Um, and, uh, and that's you know, how you begin to turn large bureaucratic boats. Um, so what you count counts at our department is information sharing in the counterintelligence and the counterterrorism environment, uh, ability to secure the air, land, and sea borders and different matrices for how we measure that, uh, smart, effective immigration enforcement so that we focus on those in our country illegally who are also violating our other criminal laws, those who are fugitives, uh, those who are repeat violators in terms of crossing back and forth, uh, the protection of cyber space and the development of an entire civilian cyber protection uh, 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 capacity, and then um, uh, basically our ability to prepare for and respond to natural disasters. And so everything that comes in, the budget, everything else that comes in, gets matched to those five priorities on the theory that uh, we could be doing a thousand different things, um, but those are the five major measures of the success of the department when all is said and done. Yeah. Hi. Um, thank you so much for coming. I'm Lori Blank. I'm the director of the International Humanitarian Law Clinic here. I'd like to follow on what you were just talking about and ask, um, in light of, I believe on your website, on the website of the Department of Homeland Security, it lists, uh, I think it's 18 critical infrastructures, et cetera. In, the, in, in light of that, which is a large number, obviously, there's lots to uh, focus on, how do you do resource allocation and prioritization in the face of that? And how do you measure effectiveness? Is there effectiveness matrix? As you were talking about some key things, you count what counts. Um, how do you do effectiveness and how do you measure it? Yeah, we divided the, uh, the, the U.S. economy was divided into 18 critical sectors by before uh, me, but it actually, when you look at them, it actually makes sense because within each of them, we can then have an advisory council of true leaders from the private sector. Uh, and if you consolidate too much, you lose that ability, right? Um, and uh, then they all feed into one directorate in the department, National Programs uh, Directorate. Um, and they marry, you know, we marry what we're getting on the intel side with what we need to be doing in terms of intersection with those sectors. So for example, uh, and this is open source now, but one, uh, there was a, uh, a piece of information that um, uh, Al Qaeda was aiming at rail uh, th that has come out recently, um, uh, post Sunday. Um, and we were able immediately to reach out to uh, all of the critical rail operators and then also to state and local law enforcement and tracks are run through and all the people who operate rail stations uh, uh, around the country to give them that information, to give them some uh, other information about tactics and techniques to watch out for, that sort of thing. And so as different intel comes in, we can marry that with what actual sector needs to be uh, doing something more specific than it otherwise is doing. Yeah. Um, good afternoon. My name is Raheem Danani. I'm an immigration attorney here in Atlanta. Um, the Georgia legislature has passed a similar bill to the Arizona bill um, regarding uh, anti-immigration uh, law. It's an anti-immigration law, basically, and it's going to get signed into law, supposedly, by Governor Deal fairly soon. 
Um, I was wondering what the um, federal government's approach is going to be with Georgia, and um, on a more longer scope, um, do you see comprehensive immigration reform coming any time within the next five years or so? Yeah, um, uh, I'm not, let me not comment on the Georgia bill. I don't comment on laws before they become law, um, but beyond that, uh, um, those decisions obviously are made um, uh, in conjunction with the Department of Justice. Um, uh, I believe strongly that we are seeing these state outbreaks because of the inability or the lack of progress on reform at the federal level. I mean, we can do a number of things to tweak at the administrative side, um, but we cannot do the kind of fundamental changes uh, that are necessary to make the nation's immigration law match up with the nation's current needs. Um, you know, the enforcement uh, stuff in the law is out of date. You know, penalties on employers who repeatedly hire illegal labor are way too low. We can't raise them by ourselves. Only Congress can do that. Um, we can't address uh, the numbers and caps on different types of visas and uh, how they are awarded. Only, only Congress can really do that. Uh, we can't, um, by ourselves, uh, grant relief to all DREAM Act uh, kids, much as we would like to. Only Congress can do that. Um, and so I think what you're seeing state by state um, is you know, uh, different responses to the vacuum created by the lack of federal action. So Maryland has gone one way uh, last week, and Georgia looks like it's going another way. Um, uh, in, in the end, there's only one way to fix this. And the one way to fix this is for Congress to take this up. So the president has engaged fully on this. Um, he had a major meeting at the White House the week before last. Um, he's going to the border on Tuesday uh, to give a border and immigration uh, address uh, in El Paso. Um, uh, but he understands that this long-term problem for the United States will not get a long-term solution without the federal government changing the law. So we're just going to keep working it. Yes. Um, what do you feel is the proper uh, position for a uh, proper way for states to go about enforcing immigration? Well, they should, um, uh, what a state should do is, is, first of all, they should be guided and directed by the policy of the federal government. The policy uh, and direction of the federal government uh, should be and is uniform across the country. One of the reasons the Justice Department sued Arizona was because it concluded that the law that it had passed interfered uh, with the direction and policy uh, of the federal government. Um, so that, at a, you know, that's kind of the minimum uh, that needs uh, to be uh, looked at by a state. Yeah, do one more. Yeah. Okay. I, I can you. feel. I can feel. Um, yeah. Well. Go ahead. Uh, Ed, Ed Genton, class of 96, I'm getting old for the people here who are graduating, congratulations. Um, Madam Secretary, first of all, I want to congratulate the Obama administration and the military for the targeted assassination of bin Laden. We all appreciate it, and we hope there are many more successful uh, attacks on Muslim fundamentalist terrorists uh, in the future. I guess my question is, who do we view as a secondary threat? I mean, clearly Muslim fundamentalist terrorism is a problem from abroad and homegrown. Who do you see as secondary problems that you know your your department is is focusing uh, good attention on? Thank you. Um, well, I think that Islamist uh, terrorism in its myriad forms and from myriad groups uh, is um, a a top concern. Um, but uh, uh, you know any. Um, uh, and, and we do this in conjunction, obviously, with the FBI at the domestic level, but uh, there are other forms of homegrown terrorists motivated by other types of ideologies. So if you define terrorism as a, as a crime that is motivated by an ideological basis and intended to uh, create a greater impact uh, to further that ideology, um, uh, which is one of the common ways of defining what is terrorist versus what is crime, um, uh, we have a number of different kinds that, that we are looking at. And I, I don't really rank them. Uh, they're not basketball teams in that sense. Um, uh, but, but there are several 
Um, but uh, I, I think it is fair to say that the, the uh, uh, is, Islamists, and it's a very, very small, you know, percentage. I mean, it's not Islam per se. It's different. It's Islamist. Um, but that, that radical ideology causes us great concern. Why? Because from the international perspective, why? Because that's where we've seen uh, potential attacks come from over the past few years. Um, Madam Sec. Sorry, just I, I'd say uh, we'll have a little chance at the reception. So if I might like to ask you to, to join us uh, after this uh, for a reception with find the you. Secretary. Uh, and i just uh, also ask you that uh, if you would please uh, stay in your places until the Secretary makes her way out to the reception so we make sure that she indeed does get there. Uh, and with that... Uh, <laughs> like I'm worried. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's what these guys are concerned about. You know, we've got okay. the refreshments there. She's entitled. All right. Okay. All uh, right. But so with that, uh, please join me uh, in thanking uh, our honored guest, a soon-to-be Emory lawyer. <laughs>